Hi, everybody. So today we are finishing chapter 21, um, which is the break or the synthesis of amino acids. Um, and this actually also covers um, nitrogen fixation as well. And the synthesis of non-amino acid molecules using amino acids. Okay, So this is sections 5, 6, and 7 of chapter 21. So our learning objectives for this lecture um, are listed here. So you will need to be able to identify and define essential and non-essential amino acids from the standard 20 amino acids and then explain why some non-essential amino acids may actually be considered essential. Be able to identify the metabolic precursors for each non-essential amino acid in mammalian cells. And then this is sort of going back um, to the previous lecture. You need to be able to compare and contrast the biosynthesis and breakdown of at least one non-essential amino acid. Um, and number four, discuss the biosynthesis and breakdown of hemes. Um, you should be able to also identify hormones and neurotransmitters that can be synthesized from amino acids and their amino acid precursors. Um, discuss how nitrogen is introduced into biomolecules using nitrogen fixation and assimilation. And then be able to identify which organisms are able to do this. And then also indicate where in the nitrogen cycle elemental nitrogen is introduced into biomolecules. So where this fixation and assimilation occurs in that nitrogen cycle. So as you can tell, we're not going to get um, too detailed in every individual mechanism of the biosynthesis for each of the amino acids, um, but you will need to know their precursors, um, me metabolics, and then you will need to be able to go into detail um, in the reaction mechanism for at least one amino acid. Okay. So essential and non-essential amino acids. Um, a number of amino acids can be synthesized by mammals. So these are our non-essential amino acids that are listed here in Table 21.3. However, um, there are a number of amino acids that we do not have the correct enzymes for in order to synthesize them in our cells. So those would be essential amino acids and must be obtained through the diet, which is this side of the table. Um, Interestingly, um, you know, when we're getting amino acids or essential amino acids from our diet, you know, not all sources of amino acids are equal. Now, although milk proteins contain all of the essential amino acids and proportions required for proper human nutrition, remember we are one of the few mammals that actually has enzymes to break down lactase so that we are not lactate int um, intolerable. However, there are still a number of people who have um, lactate intolerance, and so getting drinking milk um, may not be the best way in order to get all of these essential amino acids. So then you're going to have to have a balanced diet of other amino acid sources. Um, bean protein, for instance, has an abundance of lysine, However, it's very deficient in methionine. Um, wheat is deficient in lysine. However, it contains a lot of methionine. So if you are you know, eating beans, make sure you're eating wheat as well. Uh, and then you gotta, you know, you gotta make sure you're getting the other essential amino acids at the same time, or drink a nice big cup of milk, you know, a couple times a day. Alright? Um so what's interesting is there's a couple of what are considered non-essential amino acids that actually should probably be considered essential. So although we can synthesize arginine in our cells, um, remember this is something that we synthesize in the urea cycle, arginine is actually considered an essential amino acid because during childhood development, um, as we're kids and we're growing up, we require much more arginine um, that can be synthesized through the urea cycle. So in this instance, even though we can synthesize arginine, arginine um, as we're children and as we're developing and growing, we actually need to 
ingest um, more arginine through our diet than we can synthesize. Now, as adults, though, this can become a non-essential amino acid. Tyrosine, if you look, we find tyrosine in our non-essential amino acid um, column. While considered itself as non-essential, is actually derived um, from a one-step hydroxylation of phenylalanine. And if we look, we see phenylalanine in our essential amino acids column. So although we can synthesize tyrosine, we require phenylalanine as our starting material, and that itself is an essential acid. All right, so um, a brief overview of the biosynthesis of non-essential acids amino acids, so these are amino acids that we can synthesize in mammalian cells. Um, basically for this, like I said, you need to be able to identify the precursor of the amino acid that we are synthesizing, um, and then you would have to select one amino acid to compare the synthesis and breakdown. All right, so um, alanine is synthesized from pyruvate. It's really simple. It just takes an amino transferase. Um, Asparginine and aspartate are synthesized from oxaloacetate. So to go from oxaloacetate to aspartate, we just have an amino transferase. Um, to go from aspartate to asparginine, we utilize um, glutamine and ATP in order to receive glutamate and asparginine. So we're, we are transferring that extra amino group from glutamine over to aspar asparginine, um, and we're getting glutamate in return. <clears throat> um, alpha ketoglutarate is our precursor for glutamate and glutamine. Um, and again, you can see that we are going to utilize just in a, um, an amino transferase reaction to make glutamate directly. To make glutamine, um, we have to first kind of activate and make an intermediate um, using ATP. So we're going to transfer a phosphate group over to this um, carboxylic carbon. And then we're going to use um, free ammonia, um, maybe leaching that out of the urea cycle at some point. Um, to replace that phosphate group, and we will get glutamine. Um, some other non-essential, so glutamate can then go through a number of reactions in order to make proline, um, as well as it's also used in the synthesis of arginine with orthanine, which remember this is part of the urea cycle. All right, so... When we're making arginine, we're going to recover alpha-ketoglutarate, um, and we will get ornithine, and then through steps in the urea cycle, make arginine. <clears throat> uh, 3-phosphoglycerate is used to make serine, um, and then from serine... Uh, we can also make serine from glycine, and then we can use um, serine as well in order to make cysteine. Um, note, however, homocysteine that we use to condensate with serine in order to make one of the um, intermediates for cysteine synthesis is actually derived from methionine, which if you remember, methionine is an essential amino acid. So cysteine is another one of those non-essential amino acids that the synthesis of is dependent on um, essential amino acids being available for reactions. Okay. <clears throat> Um, also, we can make um, glycine from serine, so this is a reversible reaction. All right. Um, so now we, you know, we kind of finished off those non-essential amino acids and how we synthesize them. Um, 
let's talk a little bit about heme. So we know heme is really important, right? It's, it's that iron-containing prosthetic group um, that is found in many globular proteins. Um, remember, we talked a lot about it with hemoglobin, myoglobin. And then we also touched a little bit on the, um, how hemes are used in cytochromes in, that are found in the electron transport chain. Um, these are those metal oxidation reduction centers um, that the cytochromes use to hold the metals in place. Um, so not necessarily, or it is iron for those as well. All right, so synthesis occurs partly in the mitochondria and partly in the cytosol of liver and erythroid cells, all right? Um, as we can see, here is our reaction here. So we are going to start with succinyl-CoA and glycine. Um, we're going to have a condensation reaction with what, as well as a decarboxylation um, to form ALA, Okay, ALA is then transported out of the mitochondria, um, utilizing another synthesis. We're going to get um, PBG. So this is this enzyme is PBG synthase. Okay. Um, we go through a number of other reactions in the cytosol, and then. Um, at this point where we have this metabolite, we're going to go back into the mitochondria to finish off our synthesis of our porphyrin ring. All right, so as you see here, we're going to go through a number of other steps. We can actually introduce the iron, and we end up with our final heme. Now, what's interesting is um, PBG synthase, um, which is this enzyme right here at this step, so it's the first um, step once we exit the mitochondria into the cytosol, um, is actually inhibited by lead, all right? And what we have found recently is that ALA, so once ALA exits the mitochondria, and if this enzyme gets inhibited, then we're going to have accumulation of ALA, um, which can then go into the bloodstream, and we found that this accumulation of ALA in the bloodstream may be responsible for the psychosis that often accompanies lead poisoning because ALA is very similar to um, one of the neurotransmitters. Okay? You can read up more about that, um, I believe, in Box 21.3 um, if you want to read up more about um, the lead poisoning. Okay, um, heme synthesis itself is regulated in the liver um, through feedback inhibition of ALL by heme. Okay, so if we get an accumulation of this in the mitochondria, um, oh, I'm sorry, if we get an accumulation of heme in the mitochondria, then we are going to inhibit um, ALA uh, enzyme. Okay, so this enzyme here will get inhibited by heme. However, this is only happening in the liver. In the erythroid cells, um, this process is either on or off. And so what's interesting is in juvenile erythroid cells or young developing erythroid cells, we have the synthesis going at full speed ahead. And then as erythroid cells mature, they are going to turn off the complete synthesis. So they are going to um, stop the expression of all of these enzymes and will no longer develop any more hemes. So once the hemes are developed in red blood cells, they're done. And so that's why red blood cells have to be regenerated. Um, I think they have a lifespan of about 21 days. So every 21 days, you've got to make um, a new red blood cell. So let's talk about how hemes are degraded. So um, during heme degradation, we um, start with heme, okay? Uh, we first um, remove our iron um, using oxygen, and then we start to break down our ring. So once we remove the iron, the ring sort of unfolds, um, and we get biliverdin. And biliverdin is actually a green color. Then that gets um, reduced to bilirubin, which is a reddish color, and then using um, microbial enzymes in the large intestine, we can further break down bilirubin to make um, urobilogen, and then urobilogen is either going to get converted into urobilin, which has a yellow color, and that gets Trans that goes from the liver back into the bloodstream and then isolated by the kidney, and that's actually what gives um, urine its yellow color. 
or um, it's hard to see that. It's this is stercobilin and it has a red brown color and that gets excreted, excreted um, with fecal matter and kind of gives um, fecal matter that color. So um, the changing color of bruises are a visible manifestation of heme degradation um, as these damaged red blood cells are um, degrading that heme as the bruise heals. Okay. Bilirubin itself um, is very hydrophobic, right? It's lipophilic, and so it's transported in the blood um, complex with serum albumin, so it's a very large protein. Um, bilirubin derivatives are secreted in the bile and then can be further degraded by bacterial enzymes found in the large intestine. Some urobilin is transported through the blood and excreted in the urine through the kidneys. Remember, so it's yellow. That's kind of what it gives. It's its yellow color. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard the term jaundice. So jaundice um, is a result of excess bilirubin in the blood due to either the high rate of red blood cell destruction, liver dysfunction, or bile duct, duct disruption. And so what we end up, if we get a backup of bilirubin, we also get a backup of bilirubin. Um, and this is sort of what gives people with jaundice um, that yellow color on their skin and their eyes. Okay, so you get an excess of degraded heme um, through the form of bilirubin in the blood. All right, so um, amino acids are also precursors for a number of hormones in tr neurotransmitters. This is just an example of some of them. Um, we see that we can get epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine, um, starting with tyrosine. Okay, um, we also will generate L-dopa, which is the precursor for dopamine, um, utilizing tyrosine, and L-dopa can then become what's melanin, what is makes um, hair. Um, and skin color, different colors. Um, we can also generate um, serotonin from tryptophan. Um, GABA or gamma aminobutyric acid, which is a neurotransmitter, I believe is developed or derived from, where are you? <clears throat> GABA is derived from glutamate. Okay? And histamine is derived from histidine. Okay? So all of these metabolites um, basically involve a decarboxylation of the corresponding precursor amino acid. So we're losing um, that carboxylic carbon. Um, as you can see here, we um, first have a hydrolase reaction to form L-dopa, and then from L-dopa to dopamine, we lose that carboxylic carbon um, from the, pep the amino acid, um, what would become the peptide backbone if the amino acids were used in a protein, okay? <clears throat> Um, these reactions are therefore, since we are doing decarboxylations, are PLP, which is members that vitamin B6 um, dependent, and they also occur through the PLP shift based reaction mechanism. If you recall, we talked about that a little bit in the last lecture. All right, so now uh, let's talk a little bit about nitrogen fixation. So nitrogen is sort of one of the, one of the most prominent chemical elements in living systems. So if you recall, we have oxygen, um, hydrogen, phosphorus, carbon, and nitrogen. So oxygen, hydrogen, and phosphorus um, are pretty easy, easily assimilated. Um, we can take the elemental forms of these and assimilate it in biomolecules. Um, carbon and nitrogen, however, um, in their natural state are very um, stable. And so we have to kind of activate them in first, um, kind of make them a little more unstable so that we can transfer those or assimilate those into biomolecules. Um, if we take a look, so the major form of nitrogen in the environment is in two. 
and like I said, is extremely stable and unreactive. So an, an example is the triple bond in um, dinitrogen requires 945 kilojoules per mole of energy to break. So that's a lot of energy. Um, if you remember uh, the phosphorylizing one of the phosphate groups off of ATP to make ADP and PI, right? Remember that only releases about 31 kilojoules per mole. So you can imagine it would take a lot of ATP to break that triple bond if, if we were able to generate the energy for that using ATP. So in order to introduce nitrogen in the living systems, um, N2 must first be converted to a metabolically useful form through nitrogen fixation. So we're just going to let that ring, okay? Um, Nitrogen fixation is performed by only a few strains of bacteria known as diazotrophs, and they are found in the soil um, colonizing the roots of legumes. So these are beans, clover, and alfalfa are examples of types of legumes. Um, it's actually interesting because farmers will alternate um, their crops by planting alfalfa every few years. Um, and what that will do is enrich the soil with um, fixed nitrogen um, as ammonia, right? And that enriching the soil, they can then plant a few years of crops before all of that, um, that fixed nitrogen is used up. Um, once we use up that fixed nitrogen, then they will have to do another um, uh, crop of alfalfa. Right, so once um, nitrogen is fixed, it is then incorporated into biological molecules as amino groups, which then can be transferred to other molecules doing transamination reactions. All right, so our overall um, reaction for this, our, our equation is for every one molecule of dinitrogen, we need eight protons, eight electrons, 16 ATP, and 16 molecules of water. And then we will result, we'll end up with two molecules of ammonia, um, one dihydrogen, and then 16 ADP, 16 inorganic phosphates. So it's a very, very inorganic reaction. <clears throat> requires a lot of energy in order to generate ammonia. All right, so once we fix nitrogen, now we're going to assimilate it into biomolecules. So once nitrogen is introduced into an amino acid, that amino group can be transferred. Um, in bacteria, fixed nitrogen is added to glutamate as ammonia using glutamine synthetase and ATP to make glutamine. So this is actually something we do in mammal cells as well, right? So we first make glutamate um, by transferring an amino group from one amino acid to alpha-ketoglutarate. Um, we can then use glutamine synthetase um, in order to transfer um, another free ammonia, um, maybe pulled from the urea cycle, in order to make glutamine. However, um, bacteria or these bacteria that can um, fix and then assimilate nitrogen um, also have another reaction that takes alpha ketoglutarate plus free ammonia, NADPH, and ATP to make glutamate. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm skipped ahead. So the second reaction is we have alpha ketoglutarate plus glutamine plus NADPH and a proton to make two glutamate and then a resulting NAD+. So if we combine this reaction and this reaction together in these bacteria, we get an overall reaction of one molecule of alpha-ketoglutarate plus ammonia plus NADPH and ATP gives us a molecule of glutamate, and then NAD plus ADP and PI. So once um, nitrogen is assimilated as glutamate, it, it can be used in the synthesis of other amino acids by the transaminations in mammals. All right, so our nitrogen cycle is seen here. So this is how nitrogen is recycled through the biosphere. Um, we have a number of different forms of nitrogen, but as you see, the one that um, we use to assimilate into biomolecules is only ammonia. Um, so this is the part of the cycle um, in which ammonia is 
or nitrogen is brought into the living systems. Um, and then so we can recycle ammonia um, through decomposition of biomolecules and we can introduce new ammonia through the assimilation um, using nitrogen fixation um, of those bacteria um, on the root systems of legumes. All right, so um, that sort of sums up the end of this chapter. Um, as always, be sure to add in your muddy points on the comment thread for Facebook, and I will see you guys in class. All right, y'all have a great day.